I walked into what I thought was my home. But in that instant, it became a crime scene. My wife, my beautiful, perfect wife, was tangled in the arms of my best friend. My blood froze, then boiled. The betrayal was a knife twisting in my gut. I didn't just catch them, I caught fire. In that moment, everything I knew about love, trust, and friendship was obliterated. They didn't just betray me, they unleashed something dark inside me. This isn't just a story of a broken heart. This is the beginning of their worst nightmare. This is not just a story of betrayal. This is a tale of revenge. Are the girls ready yet? I asked my ex-wife, Pauline, as I stood at her door to pick up my daughters for the weekend. Almost. How are you, Sam? She replied, sounding a bit concerned. I only have them for two weekends a month. Please make sure they're ready on time, I said, avoiding her question. I'll do my best, but you know how it is with them, she said. You can keep them for a few extra minutes if you need to. So, are you doing okay? I'll wait in the car, I said, turning to leave. Sam. I heard her call as I walked away. I didn't turn back. We had this kind of conversation a lot, with her trying to ease her conscience and me ignoring her. A few minutes later, Karen, who was 13, and Wendy, who was 12, came out with their bags. They hopped into my car, saying they were sorry, and my frustration started to fade. Even with everything, Pauline was right. It was tough to get girls their age anywhere on time, and I couldn't stay mad at them for long. Since I only had them for a couple of days, I wanted to make the time special. I didn't want our days together to be filled with chores and normal routines. After they told me about what they had been up to lately, I got ready to share some exciting news. They had been asking for the new Nintendo game system, and I was finally able to get it for them. I expected them to be thrilled, but when I shared the news, I was disappointed. Oh, that's okay, Daddy, Karen said. Daddy Dave already took us to get one and a bunch of games. My disappointment turned to anger. Daddy Dave, I thought I was at my breaking point before, but it felt like I had found more to lose. Let me explain. Dave was my best friend since high school. He was an ordinary guy who just had better luck in business than in love. He wasn't a bad guy, he just hadn't met the right person yet. We met some of the women he dated, but none seemed like a good match. Even though he wasn't family, my kids called him Uncle Dave, which was fine with us. Pauline's best friend was Aunt Daphne, too. They were close, and we trusted them like family. I had no idea there were problems in my marriage. Everything seemed okay until one Friday night. Pauline told me that she and Dave had developed feelings for each other, and she would be filing for divorce the next day. She insisted nothing inappropriate had happened, but at that moment I didn't believe her. She asked me to leave the house. I refused and said some harsh words. I was wrong. What she hadn't told me was that there was a court order removing me from the house. Her lawyer asked the judge for temporary custody of the children and the home until a hearing could take place, which meant I had to leave. I didn't fight the divorce directly, but I made things hard by making unreasonable demands. Eventually, I got tired of it all and just signed the papers. I didn't owe alimony since we had similar incomes, but I had to pay child support, which hit my budget hard. I lived simply to make sure I could take the girls out for fun every weekend. That's why I was trying to save for the video game system. If I could be fair-minded, I might have said that Pauline tried to keep things friendly, but it was hard for me to see it that way. Why should she be nice? She got what she wanted while I was just trying to get by. Pauline and Dave married just two months after the divorce was final. The hardest part was dealing with the girls. I thought they would be more upset but they seemed to handle it well. Dave had been in their lives for a long time, so when he moved into their home, it didn't seem to change much for them. In fact, they seemed excited to have two homes to visit, just like some of their friends. Pauline and Dave were getting close to their one-year anniversary, and I hadn't said a kind word to either of them since then. Our only conversations were about the kids. Now my children were calling Dave, Daddy. I tried to keep my cool that weekend, but by the time I was dropping the girls off... I was fuming. I gave them hugs, and as they ran inside, likely to play with their new video game system, Pauline opened the door. I need to talk to you, I said, letting her know my tone was serious. I turned and started to walk away from the house, and Pauline closed the door behind her to catch up with me. What's wrong, Sam? she asked. 
Can you explain this Daddy Dave thing to me? They have a dad, and that's me. What's going on with this? The girls wanted a different name for him now that we're married. They thought it would be strange to call him uncle at home. So we thought Daddy Dave would work. And who came up with that name? I think it was my idea, but they liked it. I mentioned that you might have a problem with it, but they were sure you'd be okay. Please don't make this a bigger deal than it is. You don't get to decide that. You don't have to listen to them call another man daddy. Especially with how everything changed. Dave didn't. And what about the video games? You knew I wanted to get those, but he bought them. Why? We just thought they should have something fun to enjoy, and we weren't sure when you'd be able to do it. We just wanted to make them happy. Yeah, and it's just to impress them. Sam, that's not true. Oh, sure, let's show how great Daddy Dave is compared to their real dad, huh? You married someone who can offer everything while I'm just trying to get by. That's not true. I think it is. You're being totally unreasonable. I turned and walked back to my car, driving away from the house without looking back. I felt so angry that I worried about what I might say or do, and I didn't want to act out. This continued for the next couple of years. If Pauline and Dave thought my anger would fade, they were wrong. They tried to talk with me, hoping I would move on, but I only paid attention to things that involved my daughters. Since my marriage ended, I had not sought any new relationships for a few reasons. First, my money situation was tight. I had gotten some raises, but they didn't help much. Second, I found it hard to trust women, and I focused on short, casual meetings with no expectations. Finally, I was still very upset about everything, and I knew I wouldn't be a good partner in my current state. The idea of getting help never crossed my mind. Things changed on the first weekend in June. The school year had just ended, and I looked forward to a summer weekend with my daughters. Karen was a responsible 15, and Wendy was a cheerful 14. I loved every moment I spent with them. Are the girls ready yet? I asked as Pauline opened the door, repeating a familiar routine. They're not here, Sam, said Pauline, looking puzzled. What do you mean they're not here? I nearly shouted. They were invited to go with the Finleys to the beach for the week. They left this afternoon. They sent you an email about it a week ago. Yes, and I replied that it was my weekend and they were supposed to be here with me. You let them go? I couldn't stop them from going. Of course, because why would you care about my plans? Now you're just being unreasonable. Just tell them I'll be here to talk when they return, I said as I walked away again. That whole week was a mix of feelings. I was hurt, frustrated, and overwhelmed. I only had four days a month with the girls, and I didn't want to lose any of those. If only I had known. When I came back the following Friday night, I was ready to talk about their trip. I had only been in the house a few times since the divorce, always at the girls' request. I went inside, hoping to have this discussion in private. As I entered, Pauline and Dave were in the kitchen watching me while I walked into the living room. I wondered if they knew what conversation lay ahead. The girls were there, and I tried to stay calm as I sat across from them. Mom said you wanted to talk to us about the trip with the Finleys. We let you know by email, Karen started. I said that it was my weekend and I expected you to be here with me. Dad, I was just informing you. I wasn't asking for permission. What? You're still under 16. What makes you think you can just decide that? I told you, Dad. Mom knows the Finleys and said we could go as long as I let you know. And you thought an email telling me you were going counted as letting me know? Come on, Dad. I'm 15. We're not kids anymore. We want to do things with our friends. I really thought you would understand. I hardly see you as it is. Are you saying you'd rather go out than spend time with me? Dad, I'm saying we're growing up and want to hang out with friends. I can't ask them to change their lives around my schedule. There's always something happening on weekends, pool parties, beach trips, you name it. We're hardly at home together on weekends anymore. It hit me that my daughters were trying to say they preferred being with friends over spending time with me, but they couldn't find the right words. It felt like a stab in my heart, and I realized that my life was shifting. I wasn't angry anymore. I felt a wave of sadness as I understood how much I was losing. I didn't want the girls to see how sad I was, so I tried to keep my face calm. Okay, so what? Do you want to stop the weekend visits? I thought I heard a slight gasp from Pauline, but the girls didn't react, so maybe I imagined it. We're just really busy, Dad. I'm sure you remember that feeling. It doesn't mean we don't love you. 
That was exactly what it felt like. I had four days a month with them, and they couldn't even manage that anymore. They had their mom and their stepdad for the rest of the time. I never expected my time as a dad to end like this, but here I was. Sure, girls, I get it. If that's what you want, we'll stop the visits and you can enjoy yourselves. They both jumped up and hugged me. Thanks, Dad. I knew you'd understand. They hurried to their rooms to do whatever they wanted. It felt like it didn't matter anymore. In their innocence, they didn't see how much their choice affected me. I stood up and headed to the front door. Pauline moved to block my way. You okay, Sam? I tried to pull myself together and act normal. I'm pretty sure I didn't succeed, but I attempted to give a brave smile. Yeah, I'm fine. Actually, this gives me some time to pursue things I've been putting off. A friend in North Carolina has been trying to get me out there for years. I stepped out the door, and I think it took a moment for Pauline to process what I just said. She quickly caught up and turned me around. Wait, Sam. You didn't just say you're moving to North Carolina, did you? Yeah, why not? You heard them. They don't need me anymore, and they haven't for years. And now it feels like they don't even want me around. This is all because of what you started, Pauline. I have nothing left here and no one who wants me. You left me, and now they have too. You and Dave are their parents now. I'm out of their lives. Congratulations. You've won. I could feel tears starting in my eyes. I needed to get away from there. I could not think of anything worse than breaking down in front of the two people who changed everything for me. I stepped outside quickly and walked toward my car. I had trouble getting the key into the lock. Maybe it was all the tears that were making it harder. Sam, wait! I heard Dave call from behind me as he placed a hand on my shoulder. I didn't respond. Instead, I turned and hit him as hard as I could. He went down but was not out. I had been wanting to do that for a long time. Pauline rushed to him, clearly worried, while I fumbled with my keys again. Sam, don't do this. They care about you. They still need you, even if they don't realize it at the moment. If you leave... It will really hurt them. What do you want me to do, Polly? Stay in my tiny apartment just waiting for my daughters to have time for me, or more likely be their backup plan if something else falls through? It won't be like that, Sam. Sure it will. You heard what they said. All I had to look forward to was their visits, and now that's gone. You'll break their hearts. I don't think so. Even if it does, I won't be the only one feeling that way. Sam... You saw how happy they were to not have to come to my place anymore. Honestly, I doubt they'll even notice at first. Sam, please don't do this. I never wanted it to end like this. Maybe you didn't, but it doesn't change things. Maybe I will see you again someday. Finally, I unlocked the car and opened the door. Dave was back on his feet now, and they both stood there looking sad, though I wasn't sure they really meant it. I sat in my car for a moment, pausing before closing the door. I looked at them one last time. Take care of my girls. They both nodded slightly as I drove away. I wondered if they would tell the girls anything. I hope not. I didn't want them to feel sorry for me or feel obligated to see me. It seemed like it was time for all of us to go on our own paths. The hardest part about losing my family was letting go of our shared dreams. Pauline and I used to talk about getting old together, having our children and grandchildren visit and celebrating holidays with them. After our marriage ended, those dreams felt far away from me. I had still been looking forward to their graduations, weddings, and future families, and now I thought those might be gone too. Maybe I would reconnect with the girls someday, but it felt like this was really the end. I called my friend Tim, and he told me he had a job ready for me. It would pay better, but I still planned to send child support. They didn't require it as much, but it was my last link to the girls, and I wanted to feel like I was fulfilling my responsibilities. Just because I didn't want to be close and still feel distant didn't mean I didn't love them and want to help. I wasn't entirely honest when I said Tim had been trying to recruit me to North Carolina for years. In truth, he had mentioned he would have a job if I ever needed one, and it was finally time to take him up on that. My apartment lease had a clause that let me break it with 30 days' notice if I got a job change, so I had Tim fax them the letter I needed. I had already paid for my last month, and I just told them to keep the security deposit instead of cleaning the place. I packed up my things, even though they didn't fill my car, and I left. I drove hard, eager to arrive as soon as possible. 
mainly because sitting alone in my car made me think of the hurt I felt from being rejected by my girls. It was raining when I got to Durham. It felt ominous. Tim had a home services business and had a position ready for me. I mostly did home repairs and some pest control work. Tim suggested I get training for electrical and plumbing jobs, too, and I said I would think about it. Tim had never married. Instead, he went from one relationship to another. I don't think anyone saw him as long-term, but they enjoyed his company while it lasted. This seemed fine with Tim. I liked the work and kept busy during the day, but the nights were tough. I began to drink more than I ever had and quite a bit more than I should. Most mornings, I woke up still in my clothes from the day before, trying to forget everything. By the time I showered and put on clean clothes, I usually felt better, so I didn't see a reason to change my routine. It helped me cope with the pain, even if it wasn't the healthiest choice. A few weeks after I arrived, Tim threw his annual 4th of July party. His house was big, and he had a large backyard, perfect for hosting. He bought fireworks from a nearby stand that we set off when it got dark. The day was filled with drinking, dancing, swimming, and a little volleyball. I spent most of my time drinking and chatting with others. I can't quite explain how it happened, but after a night of drinking, I found myself chatting with a tall blonde named Melanie. She was pretty and full of energy. The next morning, I woke up alone, but felt fine physically. However, as I often did when left alone with my thoughts, I started to feel sad. It had been almost a month since I had heard from my daughters. I learned that Tim hosted his parties monthly, usually for a holiday. August has no major holidays, but Tim created one called August Days to have a reason to gather. It was on the second Saturday of the month. Unfortunately, my drinking had not improved. I ended up quite tipsy again, and Melanie wasn't there, which left me feeling disappointed. I hoped for another fun night like last month with someone I already knew. Still, I ended up meeting someone new for the night. Roberta had long, reddish-brown hair and a friendly personality. After we talked and socialized, I think I fell asleep. Like Melanie, Roberta was gone by the time I woke up in the morning. Tim made me breakfast, then I went home feeling lonely. This was my routine for the next several months. As my drinking got worse, I found it harder to remember much about the people I spent time with. The woman I met on Labor Day was blonde, but I remember her being quite dull, just lying there while I felt lucky to be with her. For Halloween, the woman I met was in a costume. Since it was a masquerade party, everyone wore masks. She had on a Wonder Woman outfit, and I think she was a brunette. Tim, being a veteran, held a party for Veterans Day in November. It was only a couple of weeks after Halloween, but no one really minded. With Thanksgiving approaching, my first one without my girls, I drank even more. I know I spent the night with someone, but I can't recall much. I woke up in the dark to find a woman beside me. She stirred when I touched her and seemed okay with it, but by morning she was gone. I only remember she looked nice. Finally, I heard from my daughters just before Thanksgiving, but it wasn't the news I was hoping for. Instead of finding out they noticed I had moved out of state, Karen called to say they had plans to go shopping with a friend. She asked if we could skip our Thanksgiving visit this year. Five months had gone by, and they still thought I lived nearby and was waiting for them. I didn't mention that I had moved and just wished them a good time. Thanksgiving felt lonely. I stayed in a hotel room drinking too much. Tim invited me to his place, but I couldn't face being around people who weren't my family. I wanted to be alone, expecting that they might come looking for me, so I made it hard to find me. The next morning I turned on my phone to see several texts, missed calls, and voicemails. Most of them were from Tim, still trying to persuade me to join him for the holiday. There was a call from my daughter Karen, leaving a cheerful Happy Thanksgiving message, thanking me for letting them go shopping. The last voicemail was from Pauline, and I hesitated to listen to it, but I felt I should, even though I knew it wouldn't be easy. Sam, this is Pauline. I know it's been a while since we spoke because I thought you wanted it that way. I wanted to check on you since holidays can be tough when you're away from family. I know the girls called you. They haven't realized you've moved away yet. Remember, they are just kids caught up in their own lives, but they love you very much. I know you're not keen on talking with me, but please let me know you are okay. A text or email is fine. I'm really sorry things turned out this way. Please, Sam, let me know you're all right. I deleted all the texts and emails, then sent a quick reply to Pauline to let her know I was alive. It wasn't the same as saying I was okay, 
but it felt easier than facing what would happen if I didn't reply. I wasn't up for much else, so I opened another beer. It wouldn't solve things, but for now, it was enough. In the weeks that followed, I struggled to keep it together. If I wasn't at work, I was drinking or passed out from drinking. Somehow, I managed to stay sober enough for work, but it was hard at times. As Christmas and New Year's approached, it was my first year without my girls, and the sadness really hit me. I felt like no one could understand how bad I felt or what I had been through. Sure, others have faced much harder times, but in my mind, my pain felt unique. Finally, the call I had been waiting for arrived. First, I got a call from the girls. I didn't answer, as they wanted to talk about Christmas plans. Since the divorce we had switched off every year between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, this year it was my turn for Christmas Eve. They left me a message to confirm. I took a couple of days to gather my thoughts to call them back, knowing a tough conversation was coming. But then I received a call from Pauline that interrupted my plans. She left a voicemail, and she sounded frustrated. Sam, it's Pauline. I hope you didn't ignore the girl's message. I told them you had moved away. They are really hurt. They always thought they could see me whenever they wanted, and learning that wasn't true hit them hard. I hope you're happy with how you made your girls feel. Sam, I'm sorry to say this, but I can't trust you with them right now. I know you wouldn't hurt them physically, but you seem like you want to hurt them emotionally because of me. I was going to suggest they visit you, but I'm not comfortable with that anymore. Please think about how this affects them. Don't damage your relationship with them because you're upset with me. They're just teenagers trying to understand. If you want to talk about this or anything else, call me anytime. Merry Christmas, Sam. Enough, I shouted, feeling so frustrated. I drank a few more beers and then called her back. Sam? You really think you can control everything? You can't threaten me with something I can't have. Sam, are you drinking? Uh, let's see, pretty much. You shouldn't drink so much, Sam. It isn't good for you. Not good for me? Who do you think you are? You've taken away everything that mattered to me. Why should I listen to you? I care about you, Sam. Yeah, I could see how much you cared when you left me for someone else. I didn't. After all that's happened, you still act like you did nothing wrong. You're only looking out for yourself! I could hear her take a deep breath. Sam, I know you're upset. Let's talk about this when you've calmed down. Who's judging who? You took everything from me. I'm hanging up now, Sam. Ah, and you just turn your back on me. How can you do this, Pauline? There was silence. She had hung up. I spent Christmas alone, mostly lying in bed. I tried to distract myself by watching sports on TV, but the Christmas graphics made me feel worse, and I ended up drinking more. I eventually fell asleep in front of a Lakers game, waking occasionally to check the score. With a service company like Tim's, there isn't much time off. We can't close for the holidays like some places. Tim had a contract to fix a house that had been damaged by the last owners after it was foreclosed. Several of us were there, and it turned out to be a good couple of days of work. The crew was friendly, which made it easier. One morning, I saw Tim's truck pull up outside. He got out with another guy and walked into the house, saying hi to everyone before coming toward me. Hey, Sam. Can I talk to you for a minute? Sure, Tim. I'm always here for the guy who signs my checks, I joked. But Tim didn't seem amused. Let's step outside, he said. Once outside, the other guy moved away to give us some space. How are you doing, Sam? Tim asked. As well as I can, I guess. I was curious about why he needed to talk. Have you had anything to drink? Only every night for the last six months, I said, trying to joke again. Tim's face turned serious. I mean today. What? No, Tim, of course not. Good. But listen, could you blow into this? He pulled out a small device. I looked at it oddly. What is it? It's a breathalyzer. I need to check. I noticed the other workers watching, and I understood this was serious. Well, I may have had a beer this morning, I admitted, knowing that probably wouldn't help. Tim held it up, and I hesitated before taking it and blowing into it. When he checked the reading, his smile vanished. You blew .04, Sam. That's more than just a beer this morning. Okay, but I'm not legally drunk. That's for driving, Sam. But if something happens here and they test you, they'll find you under the influence and I could face the consequences. I need to protect my workers, too. Tim, I'm fine. You're not fine, he raised his voice. What you do at home is your business. 
But when you bring that here and put us at risk, it becomes my problem. I need your keys. One perk of working for Tim was using company vehicles to go home. I handed him the keys. You're done for the day. Here's what will happen. Oscar will drive you home and then come back here to take your spot on the crew. Tomorrow, instead of coming here, you'll come to my office and we can talk about this. I just stood there feeling embarrassed. Instead of feeling sorry, I was getting angry. I didn't like being sent home like a child. This felt unfair and I was tired of it. You know what, Tim? I said, taking off my hard hat and tossing it aside. I don't need this. I turned and got into the passenger seat of my truck while Oscar sat behind the wheel. We rode in silence back to my apartment with only a few directions from me. When we arrived, I quickly thanked him and went inside, shutting the door with force. Frustration swept over me. I felt fine and I was upset because someone must have reported me to Tim. I didn't want others judging my choices. I opened my fridge and saw my stash of beer. I thought, why not? I had no job to go to tomorrow. I woke up in a bright room I knew was a hospital. I didn't remember how I got there, but I felt bad enough to think a hospital wasn't a bad idea. A few minutes later, a nurse came in. Good, you're awake. What happened? I asked, a bit confused. The doctor will be here soon to talk to you, she said. She checked some equipment and my IV, then left. I looked around the room, noticing the walls were off-white and a board showing my nurse's name was Brenda and my doctor's name was Anderson. Moments later, a capable female doctor entered, looking at what I assumed was my chart. Good afternoon, Mr. Beckman. I'm glad to see you awake. How are you feeling? At first, I was surprised. I expected someone different when I heard the name Anderson. Mr. Beckman? I'm sorry, I was expecting someone else, I said. Oh, no problem. My husband has the same last name, even though he's not old yet. So, how are you feeling? Very tired and just not great, I guess. What's wrong with me? From what we've found in your tests, you have consumed a lot of alcohol for a long time. You have alcohol poisoning and dehydration. If your friend hadn't called an ambulance when he did, it could have been serious. Friend? The ambulance was called by a Tim Banks. Of course. Mr. Banks asked to be informed when you woke up, but I need your permission for that. Is that okay? I wanted to say no, but ended up nodding. Yeah, that's fine. We'll keep you here for a couple of days to watch you. As your body clears the alcohol, there could be some issues that may need quick attention. Any questions, Mr. Beckman? I don't think so. With some instructions to rest, Dr. Anderson left. I turned on the TV for some noise and settled in. I felt okay, but I wasn't going to argue with a doctor. About an hour later, someone knocked on my door and opened it slightly. A man's voice came through. You ready? Tim. Yeah. He entered the room with his relaxed manner standing a few feet from the bed. How you doing? I'll be fine. Still deciding if that's good or bad, I replied, a little smile coming out. I guess I owe you a thank you. No need, Sam. You can thank me by taking care of yourself and getting back to work. I thought I didn't still have a job. What? You think you're the first employee to get upset? Sam, we've been friends a long time and I'm trying to help you through this. I might not agree with all your choices, but it's important to get your life back on track and reconnect with your kids. Don't let past issues mess up your future. I knew he was right. I wasn't hurting anyone but myself and maybe my daughters. It was time to make some changes. Tim and I chatted for another hour before he left. As the evening went on, I started to feel worse. The doctor told me my body was adjusting to not having alcohol. I hadn't had a drink in about 24 hours, something that hadn't happened in months, and it felt like my body was fighting against it. It was sad to think about. I got through the night and checked out the next day. I was given referrals to counselors, therapists, rehab centers, and support groups. I kept them all but felt I already hit a low point and didn't really need them. I believed the wake-up call from Tim and my experience in the hospital would be enough to help me get back on track. I took a couple more weeks off work. Tim was very understanding about my time away and what I had shared with him. I had enough savings to cover the financial gap, and when I returned to work, I was eager. The following months went well. The Martin Luther King Jr. Day party at Tim's was fun, and I didn't have a single drink. I didn't think of myself as an alcoholic, but I had no wish to test that idea. 
Maybe one day I'd return to drinking beer, but for now, I wanted to stick with no alcohol drinks. Honestly, the monthly parties started to wear on me. At first, I thought they could help me build a social life, but I realized it wasn't really my thing. So I skipped the Valentine's Day gathering and treated myself to a big steak dinner instead. It was the first of March when my life took a turn. It was a Saturday, and I was out running errands. As I was walking into the grocery store, I saw a wild bunch of dark blonde curls suddenly fall hard on the sidewalk. She seemed to have tripped on the curb and was now holding her ankle and wincing in pain. The few people around didn't seem to notice much, so I quickly walked over to her. Are you okay? I asked. I knew it was a silly question, but I didn't know what else to say. She looked up at me, tears forming in her light blue eyes. I think I hurt my ankle. We should get you to a doctor. I could call an ambulance, but I can also take you myself if you'd like. I don't want to be a bother. Bother? Not at all. You just made my day much more interesting. I'm Sam, by the way. Okay, if you really don't mind. It's nice to meet you, Sam. I'm Holly. I helped her up and noticed, are you expecting a baby? Oh yes, I'm about four months along. Let's hurry then, just to be safe. I carefully picked her up and carried her to my truck. I set her down to open the door and then helped her into the passenger seat. It didn't take much since she was quite small. We drove to the emergency room at the local hospital. I went in and asked for a wheelchair, then helped Holly into it. There weren't any patients waiting, so she went straight back to a room. I figured it was best to stay outside, so I settled into the waiting room. I kept busy playing games on my phone and browsing the internet. I thought at some point she would call her family so I could leave quietly. But everyone else who showed up was either a patient or they're waiting for someone else. So, I stayed. After about four hours, the big doors opened and Holly came out in a wheelchair, pushed by a nurse in light blue scrubs. When Holly saw me, a big smile lit up her face. The nurse pushed her over and looked at me as if asking where to go. I led her outside to my truck and helped her inside. I thanked the nurse, but she had already walked away. I didn't think you would still be here, Holly said. I was going to wait until someone came for you, but since no one did, I stayed. I don't have anyone like that. It's just me and my mom, and she's out of town. Did you call her? If I did, she would just worry and want to hurry home. I'll be fine. Since you waited, could I ask you for a ride back to my car? I looked at her bandaged ankle and then back to her eyes. Holly, I don't think you can drive with that ankle. Oh, I didn't even think of that, she said, glancing down. If you don't mind, why don't I take you home and then we can figure out how to get your car? That's very kind, but I feel like I've taken up so much of your time, she said. It's true, but I enjoyed it. It's much better than sitting at home. I'd be happy to keep helping if you're okay with it. Thank you, Sam. She gave me directions to her house where she lived with her mom. I parked in the empty driveway and carried Holly inside. When we got in, she stopped. Sam, I'm sorry, but I really need to use the bathroom. Would you mind showing me where it is? I led her to the bathroom and waited outside while she took care of things. While I waited, I arranged for a ride for her car. When she finished and called for me, I went in and saw she had stood up and freshened up. I lifted her again and took her to the couch. What now? she asked. Well, I need to get your car. There's no overnight parking where it is. How are you going to do that? I booked a ride to go get it. Can I have your keys? Oh, Sam, you're being too generous, but I really appreciate it. She handed over the keys, giving me the car number and where she parked. I went outside to wait for my ride, which was only a few minutes away. As I stood at the doorway, I paused. Holly, would you like to have dinner with me tonight? I'd love to, Sam, she said with a bright smile, but I'm not really in a condition to go out. No problem. I was thinking of picking something up while I get your car and bringing it here. I started to leave when I heard her quietly say, Sam. I turned back to see a serious look on her face. Sam, you do remember I'm expecting a baby, right? I know I'm a man, Holly, but I'm not clueless, I said with a smile. Of course I remember. Why? Many men aren't interested in taking on extra responsibilities. I wanted to ensure you knew what you were getting into. Holly... We just met, so there's much more to learn about each other, but your situation doesn't worry me at all. Okay, Sam, I just wanted to be sure. I understand. I'll be back as soon as I can. With her keys in hand, I went to the curb to wait for my ride, 
which arrived in about ten minutes. The trip was smooth, and I found her car easily. I figured Italian food would be a safe choice, so I found a nearby place and ordered takeout. It was close to 7 p.m. when I returned to Holly's house with the food. I found her sitting in the same spot, but now wearing a dress. I wanted to look nice for our first dinner, she explained. You could have just stayed as you were. You looked great then, too. She smiled as I set the food on the table. By the time I came back to her, she had stood up and was moving slowly on her crutches. I moved to help, but she stopped me. I need to practice. My mom won't be home for a couple of days. I pulled out her chair and she eased herself into it. As she did, I caught a soft scent of her perfume. You look and smell wonderful, Holly. I feel a bit underdressed now. You look very nice yourself. Honestly, I prefer a man who isn't too formal. We chatted about simple things. I told her about my job with Tim's company and she talked about her part-time work at a local car dealership in the title department. Her mom is a legal secretary and the main provider for their family. Her dad left when Holly was five and she hadn't heard from him since. Holly is an only child. I shared the story of my marriage, or more like the end of it. She was shocked at what Pauline had done but seemed a bit worried about how I dealt with some things regarding my daughters, although she didn't say anything. Honestly, as I talked about it, I wasn't too happy with how I handled everything. I knew I needed to find a better way to deal with things. I chose not to ask about her being four months pregnant without a husband or boyfriend. It wasn't my place, and I didn't want to sound judgmental. At one point, her phone rang, so I stepped outside to give her some privacy to talk to her mother. It was a lovely night with a gentle breeze and some clouds. I looked up at the sky, thinking about the wonderful woman in the house behind me. It had been a few years since my marriage ended, and I hadn't been in a long-term relationship since then. Suddenly, it felt like the time to think about that. Did I want to spend my life alone just because my first choice didn't work out? I needed to sort through those feelings. When she finished her call, Holly peeked out the door and told me I could come back in, thanking me for giving her space. We spent the rest of the evening on the couch talking about anything and everything, avoiding the topic of how the baby had come to be. She didn't bring it up. I didn't ask. Before I knew it, it was midnight, and we both suggested it was time to end the evening. She walked me to the door, and we said a quick goodbye before making plans for me to come back the next day to spend Sunday together. I drove home feeling very happy and had a good night's sleep. The next day, I arrived at her house around 9 a.m. with some breakfast I had picked up from a nice cafe nearby. The French toast, sausage, and hash browns were a bit pricey, but I didn't mind. I knocked on the door and waited for her to answer. When the door opened, she had clearly just gotten out of bed. Her hair was a little messy, and she was wearing a cozy green nightshirt. Wow, are you always up this early? She asked, squinting at me with a smile. It's part of the job. Construction starts early. I was just waiting for it to be a good time, I replied. Well, since you brought breakfast, I guess you're forgiven... We said another quick goodbye before I went to set up breakfast while she got comfortable in a chair. She loved the food, as I knew she would. I suggested we spend the day driving through the countryside. I had lived in North Carolina for several months, but hadn't really explored much beyond work and Tim's parties, so that's what we did. It was a beautiful day, and we had a great time. We visited a museum that thankfully had motorized carts, so Holly didn't have to walk much. We had lunch at a small local diner and spent a couple of hours just relaxing in a park we drove by. I noticed Holly often touched my arm or leaned close to me. When we got back to her home, she looked pretty tired and her leg was sore. I ran a bath for her and made sure her brace was covered to keep it dry. I found things to do while she bathed, then helped her get into bed. We planned for me to come over after work the next evening. Holly usually worked Mondays too, but decided to take a few days off to rest her foot. I brought tacos from a local family-owned Mexican restaurant, and we continued talking. I gave her a gentle massage on her foot as we chatted, and soon she started drifting off to sleep. I tucked her in and was about to leave when she sleepily thanked me for coming over. She said her mother was coming home the next day. As I thought about that, she quickly fell asleep. I figured she was letting me know that since her mother was coming, I didn't need to come by. The next night, I was at home getting ready to watch a documentary about World War II when my phone rang. Hello? Where are you? Holly's voice asked. I'm at home, I replied. Why aren't you here? I thought you were coming over. 
I thought. Well, I assumed you didn't want me there since your mom was coming home. You mentioned it just before I left last night, I said, trying to clarify. Oh no, I told you that so you'd be ready to meet her. We've been waiting for you. Okay, I'm on my way. When I arrived, Holly opened the door with a big smile and a warm hug. I stepped inside and Holly's mom, Barbara, was bringing some food to the dinner table. Despite the age difference, they looked quite similar. Barbara had the same wild blonde curls, but hers were a bit more organized than Holly's. She looked to be in great shape, probably weighing only a little more than Holly. I stepped forward to greet her, expecting a handshake, but she welcomed me with a hug and a kiss on my cheek. I'm so happy to meet you, Sam. Holly has shared so much about you. The pleasure is mine, Miss Ellison. Please, call me Barbara. And just to clarify, Ellison is Holly's last name, but it's not mine. My last name is Smith, thanks to my most recent husband. He was third in line, and I didn't want there to be a fourth. I glanced at Holly, who rolled her eyes at her mom's comments. Since dinner was ready, I quickly washed my hands, and we sat down at the table. Barbara had made stuffed pasta and garlic bread, and it was tasty. I'm sorry for the confusion, Barbara. I thought Holly meant that since you were coming home tonight, I wouldn't be visiting. That's perfectly fine, Sam. Misunderstandings happen. I was just eager to meet Holly's new boyfriend. I looked at Holly when she said boyfriend, and she smiled back at me. She told me a lot about you. I understand you work in construction. I work for Durham Commercial Services. Some of it is construction work, like drywall, but we also handle pest control, electrical work, and plumbing. It's more about home maintenance than just construction. Do you like it? I enjoy working with my hands. My boss has hinted that I might get a chance to be a project manager soon. And what about you? I'm a legal secretary. I work closely with senior partners, so I have many late nights and travel quite a bit. Thank you for being here to take care of Holly when she got hurt. I'm glad to help, Barbara. It's nice to have someone to look after. For a moment, I reflected on my past, but quickly hid it. Both Holly and Barbara seemed to notice my brief pause. We talked during dinner, and afterward I helped clean up. By the time I finished, it was getting late, and Holly and Barbara seemed ready to say goodnight. After a moment, Barbara came over to me. I'm quite tired, so I'm heading to bed. Traveling wears me out these days. It was great to meet you. She gave me another hug and a friendly smile before heading down the hallway to her bedroom. The house was a cozy two-bedroom, two-bath layout. Barbara had the bedroom at the back, and Holly had the other room with the second bathroom right across the hall. Holly asked me to turn off all the lights while she pulled up a movie on Netflix. They had a big, comfy couch, so we had plenty of room. I sat behind her, and she was in front of me. It was a romantic movie, but I mostly focused on the lovely woman in front of me. She smelled nice, and I had my arm around her waist while she held my hand. I couldn't help myself. I leaned in and kissed her softly on the neck. There's always a small worry about whether the person will welcome your touch or not. As I got close, Holly tilted her head and adjusted her shoulder, making it easier for me. I kissed her gently, and she squeezed my hand in response. After a while, she let go of my hand and ran her fingers through my hair. With my now free hand, I found myself resting it on her stomach, remembering how much comfort that brought to my friend when she was expecting. That feels nice, Holly said softly. At that point, it was clear we had forgotten about the movie. As my hand moved over her stomach, I could feel her shirt. I took my time, gently enjoying this moment together. What's amusing? I asked, noticing her smile. I was just thinking how we had the whole place to ourselves for three days. But you waited for my mom to come home before making a move, she said with a giggle. I had to admit it was a bit funny. In my defense, I didn't realize I was your boyfriend until your mom mentioned it earlier. Oh, you're definitely my boyfriend, she replied with a playful smile, leaning in for a kiss. We continued to share sweet kisses. Our affectionate moments deepened and we got lost in easy conversation and gentle touches. Thank goodness I don't mind how I look without shaving she joked, and I smiled, appreciating her openness. As we laughed and shared kind words, the atmosphere between us felt comfortable, allowing us to explore our thoughts and feelings. After a while, we both got comfortable again, holding each other closely. Time passed as we lay wrapped in each other's arms, enjoying the warmth of our bond.
When the movie ended, I gradually woke up about an hour later. I gently nudged Holly awake and we shared more warm moments filled with care. You should probably head out, I suggested, enjoying the quiet before facing the outside world. You have work tomorrow, Holly reminded me. I knew she was right, but I didn't want to leave her. I would be okay getting up early to get home if needed. With a gentle touch, she rose from the couch and I followed suit, adjusting my clothes as she put her shirt back on. We walked to the front door and as I reached for the doorknob, she gently turned to face me. See you tomorrow? You know it, I replied with a smile. We shared a brief, warm goodbye before I walked out to my truck. When I looked back, she was still at the door and we waved as I started the engine and drove away. I hoped I wasn't being too hopeful. Last night felt like a chance to explore our connection, a moment to learn more about each other. I had to leave to get ready for work the next day, but I didn't want that to happen again. Just to be safe, I had brought a change of clothes for tomorrow. I decided not to bring it up with Holly unless it came up naturally. Barbara welcomed me at the door, and I joined Holly on the couch. When Barbara called us to dinner, I was surprised to see only two plates on the table. Holly and I sat down, and Barbara excused herself. She came back about half an hour later, looking ready for a night out. In case Holly didn't mention it, I have a date tonight. I'll be back in the morning. Have a nice evening, kids. With that, she left. Holly and I were sitting on the couch. I turned to her and asked, Will she be back in the morning? My mom isn't looking for anything serious. She goes out with different guys from time to time, and she often uses that time for herself. So your mom is out tonight? Yeah, pretty much. That means we have the place to ourselves for the night. The smile on her face showed what she was thinking. I brought a change of clothes, she said. Holly pulled me into a warm hug. That's great. Go get them now so we don't have to worry about it later. I went to my truck, grabbed my bag, and came back inside. By then, Holly had dimmed the lights in the living room, creating a cozy atmosphere. I went over to her, and we enjoyed the evening together, talking and laughing. Later, we moved to the bedroom to keep talking and sharing stories, getting to know each other better. Eventually, we fell asleep, feeling happy and comfortable after a nice night together. The brief encounters I had when I first came to North Carolina were just that. Brief. They didn't compare to the connection I had with someone I truly cared for. I missed that feeling. I spent the next week with Holly, sharing sweet moments. I was mindful of her ankle injury, but we found ways to have fun together. Even though I was tired every day, I couldn't stop smiling. About two weeks after Holly's accident, I was back at work. We had spent almost every night together, but I knew I needed some rest, too. I was starting to feel worn out, and I didn't want that to affect my work. Things felt a bit uneasy when Tim and Oscar arrived together at the job site. I looked around to see if anyone seemed guilty about reporting me, but nothing seemed out of place. I was okay since I hadn't had a drink since I left the hospital, but I was annoyed that someone had tried to inform on me again. To my surprise, Tim went into the house where we were working, while Oscar stayed by the truck. Tim talked to the workers, complimenting them on a job well done. When he came over to me, I thought, here we go. Can you talk for a minute, Sam? He asked. I nodded and followed him to the side. I glanced around, half expecting him to have a breathalyzer, but I didn't see one. Is there a problem, boss? Nope. I'm just checking in on the job sites today. I noticed you haven't been to the last few gatherings, which is perfectly fine. I wanted to see how you were doing. I'm doing well, Tim. I've started seeing someone. Really? That's great to hear, Sam. I'm glad you're working on building a new life. How are things with the kids? About that. I'll need some time off soon. I'm flying back to see them. That's a good plan, Sam. Just let me know when and for how long, and I'll make sure your work is covered. I'll check on flights when I get home and let you know. I flew out the next Tuesday. I figured the girls would be busy over the weekend and might not be home. I thought they would be around on weeknights, so I assumed the schedule would be the same. Wanting to spend a night with the girls, I treated myself a bit and booked a nice hotel room with two queen-sized beds. I was ready to do what it took to mend our relationship. As the plane flew through the clouds, I thought about Holly and our farewell. She helped me look for flights and pack. She was doing much better now, but I still carried her up the stairs to my apartment, and we enjoyed some quality time together. When the time came for me to leave for the airport, we were at her home. We shared a long, gentle goodbye at the door. 
with her forehead resting on my chest after we pulled apart, her arms still around me. I'm going to miss you, Sam. I care about you, she said. I could tell she was nervous expressing her feelings for me. I lifted her chin to look into her eyes. I care about you too, Holly. I'll be back as soon as I can. Her smile was bright as she hugged me again, and then I headed off, feeling warm inside the whole way back to Austin. My flight landed around midday, so I grabbed lunch and checked into my hotel. I picked up a few things I thought I'd need during my stay, then I waited. The girls usually got home from school around 4.30, and I figured that would still hold true. After that, it was homework until dinner. At 5.15, I parked in front of the house in my rental car. I saw Pauline's car in the driveway, as well as an older Nissan that I didn't recognize. Dave's car wasn't there, so he was likely still at work. I half expected someone to come out as I walked up the path, but no one did. I figured that meant they hadn't noticed me, or perhaps they just weren't interested. We'd see soon enough. I knocked on the door and waited. After a moment, I heard, Coming! from inside. When the door opened, Pauline stood there, looking as beautiful as ever, but I realized that I didn't have any feelings for her anymore, which I couldn't have honestly said before. She looked surprised when she saw me at the door. As I stepped inside, she quickly came over and gave me a hug. I wasn't sure I would have hugged back, but she held my arms tight, so it didn't matter. Sam! Oh my gosh, it's you! Are you back? Did you move back? The girls will be so happy! She finally let go and pulled back a little. No, Pauline, I haven't moved back. I flew in to see the girls. She seemed a bit disappointed, and I thought it was probably because of the girls, not herself. For a moment, I wondered if everything was okay with her new marriage, but then I pushed that thought away. Oh, okay, they're working on their homework. I'll get them. Pauline, wait. There's something I need to say first. She closed the door and turned to listen, looking a bit anxious as if she thought I might say something bad. Pauline, I just want to say sorry for how I spoke to you on the phone that time. You know the one, right? She nodded. I was hurt. I was. Angry. You were drunk. I was, and that's never good. I didn't want to admit it, but you were right. At that time, I struggled just to care for myself, let alone the girls. But still, it wasn't right for me to talk to you like that, and I needed to apologize. Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate that. It was a tough time for all of us. Are you in town for long? I fly back on Sunday. I was hoping to have the girls for a couple of days. Why don't you keep them the whole time you're here? I'll have them pack for a few days. I'd appreciate that. Thanks, Pauline. Sam, could you come by tomorrow to talk after you drop the girls off at school? Just you and me? I expected this. Pauline often wanted to discuss things. I figured she wanted to clear her own feelings but I thought it was time for us to talk. After taking a deep breath, I replied, Sure, Pauline, I can do that. She appeared relieved and smiled. Great, tomorrow then. I'll go get the girls and have them pack. It wasn't long before the front door flew open and my girls rushed out, tackling me with excitement. I couldn't catch all their words, but there were plenty of sorry and forgive us. Eventually, we settled down on the lawn. They seemed to have grown so much in what felt like no time. They were both trying to speak at once, so I raised my hand to pause them. Girls, you don't need to feel sorry, and you don't need forgiveness. I was the adult, I should have been, and what happened was my fault. I thought I was losing your mom, and I didn't handle that well. Yeah, Dad, but we could have been more thoughtful, said Wendy. But then you'd be giving a bad name to teenagers everywhere, I laughed, easing the tension. Look, we can go back and forth on who is to blame, but I'd rather focus on moving forward. Your mom says I can keep you until I fly back on Sunday, so pack your bags. Oh, Dad, but this weekend... Never mind about this weekend, young lady, Pauline interrupted. Now go get packed. I watched as the girls rushed off, making sure they were out of sight. This weekend? I asked Pauline. Oh, we had plans to take them to the lake, but we can postpone that. This is more important. Thank you, Pauline. I didn't mean to disrupt your plans. She nodded, then went to check on the girls. I headed to my rental car to make sure there would be room for their bags. Soon we were on our way. We stopped at the hotel to drop off their things, and they both jumped onto the bed, looking around with curiosity. We had dinner at Texas Roadhouse, 
and I pretended to groan in frustration when Karen ordered a salad. It was big and looked good, but come on, it's a steakhouse. Wendy did me proud, though, ordering a steak and a loaded baked potato. Sometimes you just have to treat yourself. That evening, they caught me up on their lives. Karen told me about her new boyfriend. Is any dad really ready for his daughter's first boyfriend? His name was Rob, and he was in some of her classes. She showed me a picture, and he seemed nice enough but I remembered what I was like at that age. Eventually, I had to make them finish their homework. I relaxed and looked around online, feeling glad that the earlier tough times hadn't cost me my daughters. A couple of times they caught me just watching them. They smiled back and we returned to our tasks. It was a nice evening. The next morning I took them to school and then drove back to my old house to meet Pauline. Honestly, I didn't see much reason in meeting up. We were divorced, and that had been years ago. I was ready to talk about the kids and how to stay involved in their lives, but I doubted Pauline wanted that. I got to the front door just in time for Pauline to open it. She had a glass of water ready for each of us, and we sat down at the kitchen table. I remembered many talks we had at that table, including the one where she told me she wanted a divorce. Thanks for coming, Sam. I know you didn't want to. Unless this is about the kids and setting up some kind of time for me to see them, I just don't see the point, Pauline. Sam, it's been four years without a real conversation. I know you were hurt and I felt for you. But with all the time that has passed, I hoped that the anger would at least fade. But it doesn't seem like it has even a little. Why would it fade? Has something changed? No, nothing has changed. You still made choices that hurt our family. She tried to speak, but I raised my hand. You left me to struggle with money while you spent most of the time with the girls. That was just how things happened, Sam. I didn't marry David for money. We love each other and are happy. That's fine for you, but it doesn't help me. Should I be happy just because you are? Well, no. My point was that I didn't divorce you and marry David to hurt you. I'm glad ruining my life didn't bother you. See, that's what I mean. You're trying to twist things to make me look bad. As if I did this just to hurt you, and that's not true. Whether you meant to or not, you should have known it would happen. What usually happens in a divorce? The mom gets the kids, and the dad is left out. That couldn't be helped. I slam my hand on the table. Yes, it could. It wouldn't have happened if you had stayed true to our marriage. All those times you spent away were direct hits to our marriage, and you did nothing to stop them. I don't know what you're expecting here, Pauline, but if you think we're going to become friends again, you will be disappointed. I will be polite to you when we need to be, but that's all I can offer. Sam, you're right, and I'm sorry. I made mistakes, but I'd really like to move on from this. I know I hurt you. Is there any way now that some time has passed you can forgive me? Not forget, but forgive. I tried hard not to lash out at her, even though I felt she was being completely unrealistic. Pauline, because of you, I spent years living like a broke college student. I barely had enough to eat and lived in a poor apartment in a rough area. I'm sorry, Sam, but how could I know that? You didn't know because you chose not to know. You knew my income, where I lived, and how much child support you were getting. It's simple math, Pauline. But you didn't care enough to find out what kind of life you left me with. You still had your new life and your new husband, so why worry about me? The girls never said anything, so I thought... You avoided facing the truth. The girls never said anything because they never knew. I made sure my kitchen was stocked when they came over. I lived on ramen and mac and cheese the rest of the time. Plus, I was trying to save up to take them out when they visited. You knew it and still bought that game like it was nothing. If we have to be in the same place again, please just keep your distance. Sam, I... I don't. Is there anything else you want to say, Pauline? This might be your last chance. Sam, all I can say is that I'm sorry. I had no idea things were this bad. And you're right, I never thought to find out. I guess I thought you'd let me know if things were like that. Yeah, having my wife leave me for my best friend wasn't embarrassing enough. Pauline let out a big sigh. I wanted to walk away, but I decided to finish this discussion. Sam, I didn't consider your side, and I guess it was easier for me not to know. I felt guilty, and it let me believe you were doing fine. Of course, why face the truth when you can live in your own world? 
I guess it was naive to think we could be friends again. But we do have our daughters to raise, and I'd like to work out some visits during summer and holidays. Of course, Sam. I would never keep them from you as long as you're doing well. We can figure something out. While the conversation wasn't easy, I was relieved to have it behind me. I now saw that all those times Pauline asked how I was when picking up the girls were just her attempts to deal with her guilt. She didn't think about me as much as she wanted to believe. I picked the girls up from school and took them to a nearby miniature golf course. We didn't keep score and had a great time. Back at the hotel, I had them work on their homework while I ordered pizza. We chatted over dinner, and this time it was my turn to answer their questions. I told them about my life in North Carolina, leaving out some details and apologizing again for how I acted. They promised they forgave me and were just happy we were together again. They were really excited about visiting me in North Carolina. I also mentioned Holly. They were surprised that I was dating someone who was expecting a baby, so I encouraged them to share their thoughts. Wow, Dad, said Wendy. You're almost done raising us, and now you might start over. That's another 18 years. You do know you're almost 40, right? Her smile was priceless. We had always enjoyed teasing each other, and it made me happy we still had that. I think I remember that, but with my aging memory, I can't always remember everything perfectly. I'm already planning for a modified wheelchair to keep up with the young ones. We all burst into laughter. It felt wonderful to be with them again. When dinner was over, they returned to their homework, and I went back to browsing online. I didn't want to bother them with the TV, and there wasn't anything worth watching anyway. I called Holly after they were asleep and shared everything with her. We spoke for about an hour, expressing how much we missed and cared for each other. I shared my hopes of visiting, and she said she was excited to meet them. After we hung up, I went to bed. The rest of the visit went smoothly, with dinner on Friday and bowling and mini-golf on Saturday since there was no school. I was flying out early Sunday and wanted to make the most of my time with them, and they were happy to spend time with me. Even if they missed their friends or wanted to be at the lake, they didn't show it. On Sunday morning, I dropped them off at the house. The girls insisted I come inside to say goodbye to Pauline. I wanted to set a good example, but it was still tough. I hadn't seen Dave during the visit, and that was still true today. I figured he was trying to avoid me. The flight home was a mix of feelings. I was sad to leave my girls, but felt grateful that things had gone well while I was there. I missed Holly and was eager to be with her again. I caught a cab from the airport and went straight to her house. Barb answered the door and led me to Holly's room. She's waiting for you, she said with a smile. I opened the door to find Holly smiling back at me. Hurry up, she said. We enjoyed our time together, and our bond felt strong after just a few days apart. A knock on the door interrupted us. It's been quiet for a while, so I thought I'd check in, Barbara called. Come and get some dinner. Holly and I exchanged shy smiles, quickly got dressed, and went to join Holly's mother for dinner. By June, I had moved in with Holly and Barb. I had been staying there nearly every night, so when my lease was up, I didn't renew it. This helped me save money, though I made sure to help out with bills. With school ending for the girls at the end of May, I flew them out to visit me for a couple of weeks in mid-June. This way, they could have time with their friends after school and spend Father's Day with me in North Carolina. Holly got along well with them, and they liked her too. While I was working, Holly took them out for fun activities. Karen and Wendy would tell me stories about their adventures every night and ask when I would propose to Holly. I secretly told them I already had a ring and was just waiting for the right moment. They loved being in on the secret. There were many tears when we put them on the plane home the last weekend in June. I hoped they could visit again before school started in August, but there were no promises, and the next time wouldn't be until Thanksgiving. I also wanted to visit Texas, but with work and Holly's baby arriving soon, I wasn't sure how that would work out. To celebrate the 4th of July, we planned to go to Tim's party. I knocked on the door and Tim greeted us by name, which surprised me because I didn't know he and Holly were friends. I usually didn't talk about my job, so it never came up. More guests arrived right behind us, so we didn't have a chance to chat much, though he congratulated Holly. We went inside and mingled a bit. Soon I went to grab food for Holly and myself. Holly had been extra hungry lately, and as I loaded up the plate, I knew I would end up with less than half. Tim came over as I was putting some macaroni salad on my plate. You didn't tell me it was Holly you were seeing, he said. 
I didn't think it mattered, I replied. I had no idea you knew each other. It's a friend of a friend thing. She came to some parties last year. I think her last one was the Halloween party. He suddenly stopped talking. When I looked at him, he seemed lost in thought. What's wrong, Tim? I asked. He snapped back to the moment, but still looked serious. How far along is she? About eight months, why? Do you remember the Halloween party? Some of it I was still drinking, so not a lot, why? Well, you and Holly were both there. I saw you both go into one of the spare rooms. You're mistaken. I remember the costume. Holly, you can see, is very blonde. I know, but she was dressed as Wonder Woman that night with a dark wig. She had a mask on, just like everyone else. I paused, thinking back to that night. Maybe it was a wig, but even if Holly and I had met months before our official introduction, I didn't see how it mattered. Okay, say you're right. So what? Look, Sam, Holly had just ended a long relationship a few months before that party. Her boyfriend left her for someone younger. Neither of you were making great choices then. I don't know if you were the only one she met that night or if there were others. Tim, what are you implying? My point is, the Halloween party was eight months ago, and she's eight months pregnant. Sam, that baby could be yours. His words hit me hard, leaving me speechless for a moment. Could it really be true? Holly and I hadn't talked about our pasts in detail. She knew about my previous marriage and how it ended, but we had never discussed how she became pregnant. It was time for that important conversation. I set my plate down and began to look for Holly. She was talking with a few friends and smiled when she noticed me walking over. I was hoping you'd bring some food. I'm really hungry. Remember, I'm eating for two, she said. I know, it's just, we need to have a serious talk. I took her hand and led her into one of Tim's spare bedrooms. Holly noticed my serious look and seemed worried. Sam, what's wrong? she asked, sitting down on the bed. Holly, I've never asked how you got pregnant. I thought it was something private and you would share if you wanted to, but now I feel like I need to know. I also thought it was private. Why do you need to know? Do you trust me, Holly? Completely, Sam. With everything. I have a reason, and I promise to explain later. But for now, can you tell me what happened? She paused for a moment to gather her thoughts before speaking. Terry broke up with me a couple of months ago. We were together for years, and he always said he didn't need marriage to be committed. He left me for someone much younger, and it hurt a lot. What happened then? Many would have reached out to others to feel better, but I didn't. I shut myself off, ignoring friends who wanted to help. I fell into a deep sadness. My mom let me be alone for a while, but eventually she encouraged me to get out. I finally agreed to go to Tim's Halloween party. I didn't know him well, but my friends told him about my situation. Tim is good like that. I wasn't a big drinker, so even though I didn't have much that night, I felt brave. I met someone at the party and we connected. He's the father of my baby. I regret not telling you sooner. It's okay, Holly. This is personal and important. Okay. Are you sure he's the father? Was there anyone else that night or around then? She looked a bit confused by my question, but answered, No, Sam. There was no one else. I hadn't been with anyone since Terry and didn't until that night. What did this guy look like? I don't really remember. He was taller than me and fit, but everyone was in costumes that night. What was he wearing? Sam, why does that matter? Please, Holly, it's important. He wore a Scottish-style outfit, a loose shirt, and, uh, what do you call it, the skirt thing? A kilt. Yes, he wore a kilt and a hat-like accessory, and he even had toy bagpipes. While she talked, I looked through the pictures on my phone until I found what I needed. I showed it to her. Did he look like this? Holly's eyes widened at the picture and she stood up in surprise. That's him! What is happening, Sam? Why do you have a picture of him on your phone? I was okay until now, but you need to explain. I'm sorry I upset you. I just wanted to be sure. Sure about what, Sam? Holly, the person in that picture is me. She looked shocked as if I had just hit her. Luckily, she found a chair and sat down, still in disbelief. What? She finally managed. Tim took that picture of me at the party last year. Holly, I think that could be my baby you're carrying. Holly stared at me, unable to believe what I was saying. I let the news sink in. She looked down at her belly and then back to me. This, I, 
This is your baby? Seems that way. My God, Sam, wishes really do come true. What do you mean? I asked, a bit confused. Ever since I met you, I've been wishing this was your baby, not just a stranger's. I know it didn't matter to you, and that's part of why I love you. But I truly hoped it would be our baby. And now it is. Oh, Sam, I'm so happy. Epilogue. Holly and I quickly got married at the courthouse just weeks before our baby arrived. Once Holly was feeling better after giving birth, we had a big party to celebrate. Barbara surprised everyone by marrying one of the firm's partners and then decided to travel in a motorhome. She left the house to Holly and told me privately that she was waiting for Holly to figure things out before she moved on. It turned out there was only one man she was still interested in. With nothing left to keep us in North Carolina, except for my job, of course, Holly and I decided to move back to Texas to be near my daughter's. With the experience I gained from working with Tim, I found a better job with a higher salary, allowing Holly to be a full-time mom. We soon welcomed two more children into our family, making it a busy household. During my three years in North Carolina, Tim never seemed to settle down with any one person. We were back in Texas for two years when we received an invitation to a wedding. Neither of us recognized the bride's name. We flew out for the wedding and met the bride. I had always thought if Tim found someone, she would be very attractive. Cassandra, or Cassie for short, was different from what I imagined. She was shorter than five feet, and while she was cheerful, she wasn't what I expected. But when Tim was with her, the happiness between them was clear, and I had never seen him so joyful. By the time I moved back to Austin, my older daughter Karen was at UT, and Wendy was finishing her senior year of high school. She got into UT and other schools and was still deciding what to do. I supported her choices and told her I would be there whenever she came back. Pauline and Dave were having some issues. For some reason, Dave was feeling unsure about trusting Pauline because of her history. I wasn't sure if Pauline had done something to make him feel this way, or if it was just a thought he had. This seemed to start when Karen went to college, so maybe it was just because they had more time alone together. I didn't feel very strongly about it, but a small part of me thought it was a bit like karma. Hey listeners, if you enjoyed watching this video and want to stay updated with our latest content, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. You won't want to miss out on what's coming next. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video with Queen Cheating Tales.